Hey guys, it's Cosmic Skeptic. Not genetically modified skeptic. I know that people often get us mixed up, but this isn't the third time he's made a video about things atheists should stop saying. I've just shamelessly stolen his video idea, but his versions are linked in the description. Now, I've been talking about religion and atheism for almost five years now. God, my channel's really been going a while, hasn't it? Hello, my loyal 11 subscribers. And in those almost five years, I've spent more time than anyone should have to hearing the same talking points about atheism over and over and over again. And a lot of the time I hear other atheists consistently saying certain things that I think are at best unhelpful and at worst simply untrue. So I've taken three examples, ones that I haven't seen covered in other videos like Drew's, and I thought I'd talk them through with you. But first, a fact. Around 50% of you are apparently not subscribed. So, you know, subscribe. I also have a Patreon. Number one, arguments must independently establish a conclusion to be successful. A bit of a mouthful, I know, but I was recently talking to my friend Jonathan McClatchy, who you may remember from when I debated him back in 2019. Oh, the nostalgia for life without masks. We were catching up and talking about why public debates and debunking style videos, including the kind that I make, can often be incredibly unhelpful. And one of the reasons is that atheists often assume that in order for a religious argument to be successful, it must, on its own, prove the existence of God, or a particular God, like Jesus. This is a mistake that I myself have made in the past. Maybe the most common example of this is when a theist puts forward, say, the Kalam cosmological argument, and the atheist responds, not by denying that the argument is sound, but by saying something like, even if the Kalam cosmological argument was sound, which I hope to prove to you that it's not, it still wouldn't prove any particular God. The assumption here is that for a religious argument to be successful, it must prove the existence of God all by itself, and must prove the particular god belonging to the religion of the person proposing the argument, or else it completely fails. But this isn't true. Right? An argument's purpose isn't always to undeniably prove its conclusion. Sometimes its goal is simply to make a proposition or conclusion a bit more likely. Whilst deductive arguments may attempt to prove their conclusion, inductive arguments, like the design argument or some cosmological arguments, only seek to attest to the plausibility of the conclusion, even if they haven't incontrovertibly proved it. And even when inductive arguments are used, there are two ways in which they can be considered successful. The argument may make the conclusion more likely than the conclusion being false, that is, it's more likely to be true than false, say 80% likely, but they can also sometimes just make the conclusion more likely than it was before. It might still be unlikely overall, less likely than being true, but an inductive argument might only be trying to make it more likely than it was before the argument was used, maybe from 10% likely to 20% likely. This second kind of inductive argument could still be considered successful, given its aim, even though it doesn't actually make the conclusion more likely to be true than false. And going back to deductive arguments, when these are used, they usually aren't used to prove an entire worldview all in one go. The conclusion is rarely something like, therefore Christianity is true. They seek to prove a conclusion, but only a minor conclusion to be used cumulatively with other arguments to prove that Christianity is true when they're put together. Right? One argument concludes that there's a first cause, a separate argument concludes that there is a moral authority of the universe, another separate argument concludes that Jesus rose from the dead, and none of these on their own will prove the entire truth of Christianity, but the theist will put them together in an attempt to show why Christianity is a plausible explanation for all of them. So when an atheist says something like, yeah, well, this particular argument doesn't prove that a god exists, only a first mover, or yeah, well, you haven't shown why the moral authority would have to be god, and certainly not the Christian god, it's worth asking, did the theist ever claim that their argument could do this? You'll probably find that most of the time, they didn't claim so, they were only trying to prove a first mover, say, not the whole Christian God. That comes later, but this first step is an important piece of the puzzle. It's like if you were a detective solving a crime, and an eyewitness told you that they saw one of the suspects at the crime scene. You could turn around and say, ha, yeah, well, that doesn't prove that they actually committed the crime, does it, just because they were there? Well, no, it doesn't prove that. 
but it's still an important piece of information that could be incredibly helpful in constructing a broader case against the suspect. Right? It doesn't work on its own to prove the whole conclusion, but it's not supposed to. Arguments don't need to independently establish a conclusion to be successful arguments in favour of that conclusion. Number two, if God existed, I wouldn't worship him. This one is a favourite amongst those who might call themselves anti-theists, people who not only don't believe in God, but wouldn't want him to exist, usually because they think he's evil. I'm more of an anti-theist than an atheist. In other words, my view is not just that there is no reason to believe that there is a deity, but that it's a good thing that that's not the case. Now, there is some plausibility in this. I don't think you should never say this, but it depends strictly on how the argument is used. For example, if you believe that there could be an evil god, you might say that if he existed, he's not worthy of worship or respect. And that's fine, that makes sense. Another thing you can argue is that there's so much evil in the world that if God did exist, he would be an evil God, and that therefore, say, the Christian God doesn't exist, since the Christian God is defined as an all-loving God, not an evil God. But here's what doesn't really make sense. Saying something like, if the Christian God exists, he's not worthy of worship or respect. This might seem like a plausible thing to claim. After all, God does many things in the Bible that we might consider to be immoral. Bringing Abraham to the brink of infanticide, the genocide of the Midianites, flooding the earth and drowning all of its life. And so this God is not an all-loving God, and so not worthy of respect. The problem is that Christianity doesn't deny that these things happened. It just argues that God was justified in doing them. The idea that God has sufficient moral reason for committing these acts is embedded into the religion of Christianity as one of its fundamental principles. God is defined as a perfectly good God, and so everything he does is, by definition, ethically justified. Now, as I say, you can argue that these actions are not ethically justified, and that therefore the Christian God can't really exist, because a perfectly good God wouldn't commit them. What you can't do, however, is say that if the Christian God did commit these actions, he acted maliciously. This is because by granting that the Christian God exists, specifically as defined by the religion of Christianity, you grant the existence of a perfectly good God. That's what the hypothesized Christian God is. And so you can't talk about him acting maliciously. You can deny that that God exists, or claim that if a different God was actually responsible, he wouldn't be worthy of worship, but you can't say that if the Christian God exists, then he's evil, since in Christianity, God can't be evil by definition. So you would actually be saying something like, if the Christian God exists, he's not the Christian God, which is a contradiction in terms. In Christianity, being perfectly good is as much a part of the definition of God as having three sides is a part of the definition of a triangle. You can argue about whether or not the triangle actually exists, or whether instead of a triangle, a square actually exists instead. But you can't say, if the triangle exists, it's actually a square. That doesn't make sense. You can say that no god exists, or that an evil god, not the Christian god, exists, but you can't say that if the Christian god exists, then he's evil. Number three, religion is irrational. As with number two, I'm not saying that you can never say this. There are, of course, some situations in which you can legitimately claim that someone's religious beliefs are irrational. The problem is when irrationality is conflated with falsehood, when these aren't the same thing. Rationality doesn't mean to be correct. It means to be acting in accordance with reason and logic. You might think that, given all the arguments you've heard and evidence you've seen, there's no way Christianity can be true. And fair enough. You might think that, given these arguments and this evidence, it would be irrational to believe in God. That's fair enough too. But you shouldn't say that anyone who is Christian for any reason is therefore being irrational. That's not always true. A belief being rational is not the same as it being true. The crucial question that needs to be asked on this point is, can someone hold a false belief rationally? And the answer, as far as I can see, is obviously yes. If you have good reason to believe something to be true, despite it actually being false, you can be rational in believing it. I think that, for instance, an unsocialized, uneducated child who was never taught about astronomy would be rational, looking at the sky, to conclude that the sun revolves around the earth, despite this being false. 
to the best of that child's ability, he's evaluated his observations and used the best information and intuitions at his disposal to come to this conclusion. He acted in accordance with the best reason and logic he had available. The conclusion may be false, but it would be unfair to claim that the child is being irrational. Similarly, a person can irrationally believe a true proposition. Suppose that somebody believes correctly that it's raining outside but they're in a small room with no windows. They have no actual evidence that it's raining. The reason they believe it is, is because it was revealed in a dream to them by an imaginary friend. Right? It would be irrational to trust this revelation, despite the fact that its conclusion happens to be true. The person does believe in the true fact that it's raining, but does so irrationally. In other words, don't conflate your conviction that a religion is completely false with a conviction that it's always irrational to believe in it. Rationality is not about the truth of a belief, but how it was formed and whether it was done so in accordance with reason and logic. To be clear, there are obviously many times in which religion is irrational, if adopted for irrational reasons. But there are many compelling, at least at first glance, arguments for the existence of God. And perhaps a person has only ever heard these and never had a chance to encounter any rebuttals to them. I think it would be perfectly rational to believe in God if that was all the person had to go on. Right? Imagine if this person, who only has access to arguments in favour of religion, decided to completely ignore all of them and be an atheist simply because, say, they didn't like the conclusion. This would be irrational in their situation, to reject the arguments just because they don't like them. They would be an atheist, and you might think that they're correct in being so, but they didn't arrive there rationally. Also, someone might believe in God because of a multitude of arguments that perhaps you've never even come across. Now, sure, after examining these arguments, you might conclude that they're being irrational, but you can't conclude this until you've made this examination of those particular arguments. Again, accusing someone of irrationality is not saying anything about the truth of their belief, but rather the epistemic means they used to get there. If you don't know the arguments they used to get there, you can't assume they're being irrational, since rationality and irrationality really strictly apply to these arguments, not the conclusion they lead to itself. In other words, there are rational Christians, rational atheists, irrational Christians, and irrational atheists. And if you agree that there are at least some rational Christians, you can't claim that Christianity is always a product of irrationality. If you meet someone who tells you they're a Christian, you're welcome to say, hey, I think you're wrong, I think you hold a false belief, you hold a dangerous belief even, if you like. But you can't say they're irrational until you know exactly why they hold that belief and have concluded that their reasons are illogical. Some of the most rational people I know are Christians, and indeed some of the most irrational people I know are atheists. Again, there's nothing wrong with claiming that a specific person is being irrational in holding a belief if you know why they hold it, but you can't then generalise that all people who hold to that same conclusion must be irrational too. Many will be, surely, but you have to find out exactly who is and who isn't before going around and pointing the finger. One thing that's almost certainly rational, however, is choosing to subscribe to my YouTube channel. And if you really like my videos, be sure to click the notification bell as well. And if you really, really like my videos, then please consider becoming a supporter on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash cosmic skeptic. A special thanks as always, of course, to my top tier patrons and a reminder that my supporters have early access to videos as well as other perks like voting on video topics, personalized video messages, and more. Click the link in the description for more information. But in the meantime, I've been Alex O'Connor or Cosmic Skeptic. You can find me on social media here. I've been posting exclusive short clips on Instagram recently for you to check out. I also have a new second YouTube channel. A link is down below. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one.